Good morning. Welcome to church. Let's sing praises to our God.
Hi Church family, Pastor Brendan here bringing you another Kids Talk this week. So glad that you could be with us. And we've gone through the beginnings of the Gospel of Luke so far. We've seen Jesus be born and grow up and, uh, and start gathering his disciples. And now, for the next whole bunch of weeks, we're going to be looking at the stuff that Jesus did in his ministry. Once he was a grown man, he had followers, and he had three years in which he was telling people about the good news. He was foretelling that what was going to happen to him, and he was doing miracles. And this week, we have one of his most famous miracles, one of his most famous teaching, one you might know a little about. It concerns a man being lowered down through a hole in the roof. It's a pretty cool thing. Let's hear it. This story comes from chapter 5 in the Gospel of Luke. There was a man who couldn't walk, and he lay on his mat every day. He heard that Jesus made sick people better, and one day Jesus came to a house in his town. I wish I could go and see Jesus, he said sadly. His friend said, we'll carry you. Jesus can make you better. You must see Jesus. Hold on tight. And they picked up his bed, and off they went. When they got to the house, they couldn't get in. There was no room at all. We have an idea, said his friends. We're going to climb the stairs onto the roof. Hang on tight. And his friends made a hole in the roof, and they looked down, and all the people were looking up, and his friends could see Jesus too. And they lowered the man down on ropes, bed and all. People moved back to make room, and he landed right in front of Jesus. And Jesus smiled at him. And Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now the Pharisees who were there hearing this said, What's he on about? Only God can forgive sins. But Jesus said, What do you think's easier, forgiving a man's sins or healing him, making him walk? Because I need you to know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. Get up and walk. Take your bed with you. Go home. And the man got up. He had never walked before. He stood up. He jumped. He danced. He ran. He shouted, Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. And he took his bed and he went home. So there's two lessons we can draw out of this story. The first is that these guys knew that Jesus was the most important thing, and they were going to get to him no matter what stood in their way. So they climbed up on a roof, probably with everyone thinking they were crazy, and they brought their paralyzed friend up on the roof, and they lowered him down through a hole they made in a roof that wasn't their roof, someone else's roof, so they must have got in trouble for that later. And they brought him to Jesus, because they knew, as we should know, that being close to Jesus is the most important thing that we can do with ourselves. That's something that's worth knowing. The second part is, Jesus is talking about the forgiveness of sins, and those Pharisees don't like that. They hear that, and they know that God forgives sins, and he does it through the temple. So what's Jesus going on about when he's talking about forgiving sins? They don't get it. But Jesus is the Son of God, and that means that he's the real way that you get close to the Father. That he's the one you have to go to to get your sins forgiven so that you can know God and be his friend and become a child of God. Really, you see, he forgives the man's sins before he even thinks about healing him. Because the forgiveness of the sins is the most important part. Even though this guy's paralyzed, he can't walk. That's pretty extreme, but Jesus straight away says, your sins are forgiven. That should tell us something. That tells us that whenever Jesus is doing a miracle, like healing someone or feeding a crowd or, or doing anything like that, that's really just kind of the secondary part. That's the, the less important part of what Jesus is doing. Really, he's just showing a flash of what it's going to be like one day in the kingdom of God, where there isn't a shortage of food anyone has to worry about, where there isn't sickness, where there isn't pain, where all those things are washed away. Jesus is showing through his miracles what that will be like. But the main thing that Jesus has come to do is to see the forgiveness of sins. And that's something that he secures himself when he dies on the cross. He pays the price for us. So we should pay attention to that. We should know that whatever we're praying for, ultimately, Jesus has forgiven our sins. If we love him, if we follow him and call him Lord, then really the most important thing is secure. We can ask for God's help in everything, but he's already given us the most important thing of all. So let's pray together. Father God, help us to remember always that being in a relationship with you and your Son and your Holy Spirit is the most important part of our life, and let's not let anything get between us. And Father, we thank you that we can pray to you for everything. 
We thank you most of all that the most important thing, the forgiveness of our sins is secured. We know that for everything that we've done, all the bad stuff that we've done, that ultimately that you've paid the price. And that means that we get to have the hope and the secure knowledge, the joy that one day we will be in the kingdom with your son and with you and with your Holy Spirit forever in a place without pain, without any suffering at all. What a wonderful blessing that is, God. We thank you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, guys. Keep sending that in that art. Keep sending in those projects. If you have any questions, feel free to send them to me. I would love to answer them. Uh, but right now, I'm just so delighted that I can help you guys in this way and that we can gather together like this. God bless you, church family. See you next week. Hey, guys. Hope you're enjoying your holidays. I know it's been an absolutely crazy couple of months, and it means that we've had to miss Kids Club this year. But that's okay, because next year is going to be an absolute blast. It's going to make up for all the fun we missed this year, and I really hope to see you there. Hopefully next year we'll be able to join again and sing together and dance again and have some fun and laugh at all my jokes. Now, we couldn't go by without singing one of our Kids Club songs this year, so get up on your feet and get ready to sing and dance along to Whole Lot of Change. Well, welcome to church, one and all. It's great to have you with us. I've just got a few announcements for us to cover. And first and foremost, I just want to remind you that we're about to celebrate communion. So if you haven't got those elements prepared, a little bit of bread, a little bit of wine or juice, uh, please make sure that you do that soon so that you don't miss out and we'll be able to celebrate that together. Now, in last week's bulletin, there were a number of SU camps that were advertised. Well, a number of those have already happened, uh, but the last of these uh, will be starting tomorrow. So that's the Winter SMAD camp. Uh, as I said, it is on tomorrow, so it runs from the 6th to the 10th of July. It's for grades 7 to 12 and uh, it's $55 for that period and uh, we encourage you to look at the details in the bulletin last week or if you like get onto SU's website and you'll be able to find some details there as well. 
We also have a position advertised as vacant in our office. There's an administrator's position there. It's a full-time position. And so we encourage you, if you believe God is calling you to that position, to contact Peter at the office. He'll be able to give you an information pack and uh, you'll be able to apply for that. Applications close on the 10th of July. So uh, if you believe that's you, please avail yourself of that information and get an application in as soon as possible. I also want to say thank you for those who are faithfully giving, but to remind you that uh, we are giving mainly electronically. If you have any questions about how to do that, uh, please contact Peter again in the office. He'll be more than happy to help you. And uh, as you've experienced throughout our weeks, there is a give button that comes up in the public chat during these broadcasts. So please avail yourself of that. It'll take you to a link where you can actually make online donations as well to the church. So thank you one and all. I hope you enjoy the rest of the service and I'll see you a bit later on. Let's just come before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this time where our kids are having a break from school. And Lord, I just want to pray for all the families who are enjoying company with their children. I pray that you'll be in their midst. I ask, Lord, that they will just um, have a great time of reconnecting with each other, that our kids will be well rested as they head back to school. Lord, I want to pray too for um, those amongst us who are university students. And Lord, things have been jumbled up for so many of them at the moment where they thought they were having breaks, but now their studies have been brought forward. Some are involved in practical work that they didn't realize they'd be doing. So Lord, I just pray you'll calm their hearts. I pray that you'll be present with them, that they will know your love in a very real and powerful way. I ask, Lord, that they will just achieve all that they need to do, that you'll reward them for the hard work and study that they've put in, and that, Lord, they will find times of refreshment as well. Father, I pray for all of us that we'll find time to prioritise you, that we will make you the first and most important purpose of our lives, that we'll be found praying, reading your word, and each and every day, Lord, honouring and glorifying your name. Father, I want to pray for those amongst us who are not well. There's many who are recovering from surgery. There's many who are sick with other illnesses, Lord. I just ask your hand will be upon them. I ask for restoration to full health. But in the midst of that, Lord, I pray wisdom for the attending physicians. I also pray for uh, these people to be a witness for you in the midst of these difficult situations, that, Father, others will, who are looking upon them will see that there's something different about them and that they will be willing to ask the question as to why they are different, what it is about these people that makes them set apart from others. And, Lord, allow them to seize every opportunity to speak about the difference that you have made in their lives. Father, I want to thank you too for everyone who is involved in making these services happen. It is such a blessing for us who just look on each week, Lord. And I just pray that your hand and blessing will be upon them. Pray particularly for Josh as he has a bit of a break, Lord, that uh, you will refresh him as well and that he'll bring him back fully revived, Lord, and that his family will have a great time of reconnecting as well. And Lord, I want to pray for each and every one of us who bring an offering to you. Lord, let us realise this isn't about... Uh, us and the church this is about us and you and Lord we are honoring and glorifying you by giving back what you've blessed us with all we have is yours anyway Lord so let us give cheerfully let us honor you in it, not only the gifts that we give but in the attitude in which we give it and I just pray Lord that you will allow us to use the funds that we have to glorify and honor your name and to further your kingdom on this earth and we pray this now Father in Jesus name and for his sake Amen. Thank you, one and all. Welcome, church family. It's time for us to gather together in communion, uh, also called the Lord's Supper, also known as the Last Supper, recreated for us here again and again. And this is a very important thing for us to do as Christians. Uh, it's one of the few things that, uh, one of the few kind of repeated ritual, um, ordinance, uh, sacraments, if you want to use that word, that all Christians do and appreciate. And this is one of those things that unites us. And so it's very important for us to do this and to take it seriously. And when I say take it seriously, I don't mean uh, that there's a danger of doing it wrong if you're really, 
you know, if you don't pay attention or something like that. Um, some of you are gathered around your, uh, with your family in your living room right now, and you don't have exactly bread and wine. Um, you have something similar. My most exotic uh, elements that I have used in my own personal scrambles to get together uh, communion bits and pieces from, uh, for me at home. Uh, I think I had a, um, a purple, like soluble vitamin tablet water uh, was my, uh, my blood for that purpose, and a Arnott's hundreds and thousands cracker um, was, the, was the body, was the bread in that case. Um, and those are not traditional elements, I appreciate that. And to be fair, this is not wine. Uh, this isn't even exactly grape juice, this is grappetizer, this is sparkling grape juice. This is the sparkling blood of our Lord. Um, and this is gluten-free bread. You could say it's bread, but if you were to serve it to our Lord at the Last Supper, he would not recognize it as bread. Uh, and if you had said to him, Lord, here is some bread, he would say, is it? Um, and that's, that's no knock on gluten-free people. Um, that's just something that you have to adapt to. Um, but that's the case. The truth is, the power of communion, the idea of communion, doesn't rest in the elements themselves. Uh, this isn't magic. We're not casting a spell. We're not doing some kind of weird medicine here. What we are doing is recreating the pattern that Jesus established for us when he did this with his disciples. And recreating that pattern is something that we need to do. And the idea for this is that it takes us out of our routine, our daily life, our, uh, our day-to-day -day in which we are an individual, we're part of a family, um, we're striving to accomplish our daily goals, and we come and we do this ritual that reminds us that we're actually part of a, a different thing as well. We're actually part of this kingdom of God, this, um, this family of believers that spans across the, <laughs> across the depths of time back to the, the coming of our Lord. And even before that, you can include the family of God, the, uh, those who, who honestly pursued God with whom uh, he had a relationship. And into the future, there's gonna be people who come after us who are doing this, who are united with us in that they are doing communion as well. Uh, and that's a, a, a broad, amazing cosmic family that we have a, a privilege of being part of and that we're inducted into because we call Jesus our Lord and Savior. And we recognize that he spilled his blood, he poured out his blood for us so that our sins could be washed away. And he allowed his body to be broken so that we did not have to pay for those sins that we'd committed ourselves, so that we could become sons and daughters of God. So it's the pattern, not the elements, that's important here. And so if you're the kind of person who has a little bit of free time and you want to kind of um, make sure that you're not uh, doing communion too carelessly, I guess, then, you know, make, go out the day before and get some, like, special bread, maybe the kind of bread that you only get for this. That would be a cool thing to do. Uh, maybe you want to have a communion glass that is only for your communion and use that at home. Um, it would be, what a wonderful way to redeem a shot glass from its, like, previous lifetime of debauchery and alcohol. Oh, terrible. Um, but however you need to, make that, make that significant enough that it takes you out of your normal routine. Now, you may be the kind of person for whom being able to pause for 12 seconds and reflect on your relationship with God is enough to take you out of a frantic daily routine. Uh, maybe you've got uh, the demands of a, of a family um, and a lot of stuff going on, and you know what? Maybe all you have is grappetizer and hundreds and thousands of biscuit. That's fine. Uh, God's not going to audit the elements that you used and then exclude you from the kingdom of God because you're part of his family. If you look at this and you say, this reminds me that my Savior poured out his blood and allowed his body to be broken. And so, I'm going to read what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take the bread.
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink this cup. Having done this together, we're reminded that we're part of that family of believers that stretches out across all of time, across all of the world, that has no boundaries in Jew or Gentile or slave or free. What a wonderful thing it is that we get to be part of that family of God. Let's pray together and thank our Lord for what he's done for us. Father God, what a debt of gratitude we owe to you for what you've accomplished for us through your son, Jesus. We thank you that he was willing to come and to give his life for us, to lay down his life, to bleed, to be broken, to be raised up for us. Father, we thank you. We're not worthy of that sacrifice, but by that sacrifice, we pray he make us worthy, that you draw us up, make us more righteous, better, uh, more attentive to your will. Help us to recall each day what has been done for us and to strive to live in the manner of the Savior who gave so much for us. These elements remind us of everything that has been done for us, Lord. Help us to live worthy. We thank you and we bless your name. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my sin.
Good evening, Night Church family. I'm Chanel and I will be bringing you the Bible reading for tonight, which comes from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 18. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawlessness and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory now and forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good evening, one and all, and thank you so much for joining us for this evening's service. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And again, I want to thank everyone who's involved in bringing these services to us. It has been such an incredible blessing to each and every one of us that we're capable and able to do this. So thank you again for all those people behind the scenes who are doing so much. Uh, the passage that we're going to look at this evening will conclude our study in 2 Peter. And so it's potentially right to uh, recap where we're at and uh, what Peter's spoken about. And we need to remember Peter's main purpose in writing to the church is to encourage the Christians to live godly lives. His desire is that they become so caught up in remembering, dwelling upon and learning about the things of God, or as he says, partakers of the divine nature, that they will escape the corruption of the world and certainly the false teaching that is part of this book as well. And Peter firmly believes if they do these things, if they d diligently confirm their call, they will never stumble and they will be provided an entry into the kingdom of God. He's concerned about the false teachers and he dedicated a chapter to that and said that they are amongst the church men and women who feed on their own desires and they are found seeking and encouraging others to do the same as them. Part of their teaching is that Christ is not coming back anytime soon anyway. And in fact, he may not even return at all. And their actions and attitudes reflect that they're not really in submission to Jesus. And Peter writes to counter the influence of these people and their lifestyles on true believers. Peter's call is for all believers to look forward in anticipation of Christ's return. And when he comes, believers should be living holy, godly lives found following all the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, which are contained within the Bible for us. Remember these things and apply them, which is what we spoke on last week. Tonight, I believe Peter's call is for us to be prepared for, or more living in expectation of Christ's return. Before we get into that, let's just pause and pray. Father God, I thank you so much that again, we can just be gathered together like this. I thank you, Lord, that you are the Lord and Saviour of each one of us and you've done so much for us. And Lord, tonight I ask that you'll just open our hearts and minds to hear from you, that you reveal to us the truth of your word and that, Father, we will submit ourselves afresh to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So first and foremost, I believe Peter touches on this subject of one day being as a thousand years for Christ. And Peter is concerned with the false teaching that Jesus is not returning and the anticipation and expectation of his return is beginning to fade or wane amongst the believers as well. And as a result, the motivation for them to live morally, ethically and holy lives was also beginning to fade. 
And it stands to reason, if Christ isn't returning, if this is not true, why would we live that way anyway? The Christians of the day were expecting Jesus to come back soon. And they're now in a stage where it's 30 years since Jesus, since Jesus ascended. And they're asking, when is he coming back? Is he ever coming back? And Peter says in verses 8 and 9, Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And Peter wants to affirm the fact that Christ is returning and he begins by raising arguments against the false teaching that was going around saying that Jesus was not returning. He indicates that we are looking things the wrong way around, looking at things the wrong way around. Our thoughts are from the perspective of humanity, how we live in time and space. But God is not like that. When he says one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day, he simply wanted to point out that God is living outside of our experience. He lives outside of time. And it's believed that Peter was alluding to or pointing to Psalm 94, which says, For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, or as a watch in the night. Here it says, Yesterday is as a thousand years to God. It's like a watch in the night. It's fleeting. It passes so rapidly for God. It means nothing. And we have difficulty understanding God's timing because of how limited our minds are. God lives outside of time. He knows all that happened in time past. He knows everything that is happening in time present. He knows everything that is happening in the future. That's why we don't need to fear because God has already been in our future. He knows what is going to occur and he works things in his timing and his purposes. He holds everything together by the power of his word. Nothing is impossible for him, even when we would say that time limits. I want you to think about Abraham and Sarah. God said he would give them descendants as numerous as the stars and he did. And it was in his time. And that timing was a time when we would say it was impossible. We would say it was too late for Abraham and Sarah. Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90. And God says, I will give you a child. And he did it. Think about what it would have been like if Abraham and Sarah were our friends. We would have had those conversations where we said, well, maybe you didn't hear God clearly. The time has obviously passed. How could this happen now for both of you maybe we would say that they took things too literally and God was speaking metaphorically and he was going to give them a child another way regardless of all of that though God came through his word can be trusted if he says he's going to do it he will do it without question without fail and we can be secure then in the fact that Jesus is returning there's going to be many who oppose this belief. And as Peter has discussed, some will actually be in the church. But regardless of the scoffers, we are told in verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And Peter now moves to address the argument that God is slow to act. And the word slow here means delayed or late. It can even mean loitering. It's a human perspective projected onto God. It gives the impression that God is unable to fulfill the word or the promise that he has given. And it's, it has this connotation that he can't do it. It's through a lack of ability. It's through forgetfulness or apathy, meaning he no longer cares or is interested in fulfilling that promise. But as Peter explains... Some may think God is being slow, but he is really working everything out precisely as he has always planned. He is meeting his schedule down to the last minute. He laid out everything before the beginning of time. His plan is in place and he will complete it at exactly the right time. The delay that is being experienced is because of God's patience. Scripture tells us that it is God's desire that not one be lost. 
He doesn't want any to perish. And so his patience at this time is God providing the opportunity for people to hear the gospel message and to repent. It is not a failure to fulfill the promise, but it is a reflection of God's great love for us and all of mankind. And this is an idea or theme uh, that is repeated throughout Scripture, God's patience and forbearance. It is a theme that occurs in both the New and the Old Testaments. Habakkuk 2.3 says, For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. It seems slow. Wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. For many, Christ's return may seem slow. They may not have been readily able to explain why Jesus' return appears to be delayed. But we and all believers can be assured that he will return. But before he does, God is ready to pardon. He will be gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness towards all men, providing every opportunity for them to come to repentance and knowledge of the saving grace of our Lord and Jesus Christ. But we also need to remember, just as 2 Peter 3 says, as well as the passage we've heard from Habakkuk, God will not stay his hand forever. The day of judgment will come, just as he said it would. The righteous will be saved, but those who have refused to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Saviour will suffer eternal separation from all things good. This will be the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is again a term that is used throughout Scripture, New and Old Testament alike. There are passages like Isaiah 13, 6 and Joel 1, 15, where the day of the Lord constantly refers to that day when God will move. He will save the faithful and he will bring total destruction to the wicked. His judgment will fall upon them. And Peter says in verse 10 of the passage we're looking at tonight, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Here in verse 10, Peter is again assuring believers that in contrast to God's patience with the sinner, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And this is a common theme also taught by Peter. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, you know that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Both Paul and Peter are emphasizing that Christ's return will be sudden. They use this metaphor of a thief, and a thief strikes when it's least expected. There is no warning, there is no announcement, there is no fanfare, and so too will Christ's coming be. It will be totally unexpected. But as believers, we do not need to fear this. The day of the Lord will be a day of refining and purification for us. The heavens will pass away with a roar. The heavenly bodies will be burnt up. I'm not sure what you think about when you read about the heavens passing away with a roar. But uh, in my younger years as a teenager, I witnessed many cane fires and uh, how they used to burn the cane, they, they would light up one end of it against the wind and it would backburn slowly. And once that fire had burnt a certain portion of the cane, they would light the other end of the cane. And the fire would rush through uh, the crop. And as the flames came uh, rushing through that crop, at times it sounded like a train coming. It really did roar, literally. And that's the image I have when I think of the heavens passing away. It's this roar of fire is being totally consumed. It is gone. And the heavenly bodies or elements, as some translations say, will also be burnt up. And most believe this is the sun, moon and stars. And it affirms the Jewish belief that in that last day, even the stars will be destroyed. And then we're told the earth and all its works will be laid bare. It's believed that this is referring to the works of men being revealed. And I want you to think about the parable of the sheep and the goats. It will no longer be about what we say, but the true motives of our hearts and what we do will be revealed. It will be all tested by fire. 1 Corinthians 3.13 says, Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, 
because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. And as I said earlier, this is a refining. Our works will be tested and purified. If how we lived and what we did are proven to be of God, if we have done it for Him and His purposes, we as the righteous will shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of the Father, as it says in Matthew 13, 43. So we do not need to fear the coming of the Lord. We should look forward to it. We will be purified. This body we have will pass We'll be given a new body. We'll enter into God's reward and we will live with Him for all of eternity. No more sin, no more pain, no more heartache. All of eternity to praise and glorify an incredible Saviour who we will see face to face. And with this in mind, how should we live? When we think about Christ's return, the fact that He could come any time at all, When we least expect it, it should motivate us, motivate us to live lives that are pleasing to God. Time is short. Think about even our lifespans uh, compared to all of eternity. It will not be long till we are face to face with our Saviour. And again, Peter says in verses 11 and 12, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you be? to live lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. All things, everything, will be dissolved or destroyed on that day. It speaks of everything that God has made or created and humanity is part of that creation. When this destruction takes place, when the day of the Lord is upon us, we will all, believer and non-believer alike, come before the very presence of God. For those of us who know Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, we'll enter into His eternal rest. For those who don't, they will be judged and they will suffer eternal punishment. As believers, we're told we should long for this day. We should earnestly desire it. We should hasten or speed its coming. And this is a call to action. We as believers play a vital role in hastening this day of Christ's return. All through history, believers have prayed, Maranatha, come, O Lord. The Lord's Prayer petitions God, your kingdom come. In Matthew 24, Jesus tells his disciples to proclaim the gospel to all nations and then the end will come. And Peter, when he addresses the crowds in Acts 3, 19 to 21, tells the people to repent in order that God may send Jesus. So the call for us is to live holy lives, obedience to Jesus' teaching, telling others the gospel message and proclaiming the truth to all men. We should do this because we long to be purified. We long for the fulfillment of the hope that we have, that we will spend eternity with Christ. The heaven and the earth will pass away. The devil will be dealt with once and for all and we will have no, and he will have no more influence over us. And in the absence of evil, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And in that new heaven and new earth, righteousness will dwell. As believers, we are promised a new heaven and a new earth. When Peter says heaven and earth here, he's speaking about all of creation. In Genesis, God created heaven and earth. It was paradise, a place where mankind could dwell in perfect fellowship with God. It isn't only humanity that has suffered because of sin. Romans 8.22 says, For we know that the whole of creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. All of creation groans, longing to be renewed. It will be renewed and there will be no more sin. Creation itself, along with mankind, will be liberated from the terrible bondage of sin. This new place will be the home of righteousness. Righteousness will dwell there. It will be a place where it permeates everything. 
Think about that. There will be no more fear. You will be able to trust everyone without reservation, without concern. The love that will be experienced there will be unfathomable. We will see Jesus face to face. We will be in his presence. Can you imagine what that will be like? If we even get an inkling of that, I believe we will pray more fervently. Come, Lord Jesus. And we'll be more committed to living for him and telling others about him. So we hasten that day. Come, Lord Jesus. So we look forward to that day. And we wait for these things. And we are diligently being found in him, by him, without spot or blemish. And we will be at peace. The call here is if we are looking forward to living in that home of righteousness, then in the here and now, we should constantly practice such living. The call is to be diligent, a call to be careful how we live. We are to apply biblical truth to our lives. We are to both proclaim and live the gospel message. We are to develop a deep relationship with God. And Peter's call is for us to be spiritually clean, without spot or blemish. Think of the sheep or goats that were sacrificed. They were to be without spot or blemish. How do we do that? We are to be found secure in the vine. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Abiding in Christ is about having that connection with him. Think about that image of the vine. We are the branches that have been grafted into the vine. We are those Gentiles that weren't part of, of the Israelite nation, but we've been grafted in. Christ is that vine and he gives us life through that connection. We are in him and he is in us. It is a bond or union that we have with him and it is achieved through Holy Spirit. If we ever sever that connection... We have no life, not one that matters anyway. And we will not bear fruit. And that's what we're called to do. And so abiding in Christ is about depending upon him. To live as we should, we should be totally dependent upon Jesus living in us. And this is, again, is achieved through the Holy Spirit. If we fail to main this connection, maintain this connection, we will die. And it's about personal quiet times. It's about reading the word. It's about praying. And it's about doing that personally. But it's also about doing that corporately. It's about gathering with others and talking about the things that God has taught us and shown us from his word and praying for each other earnestly. So it's a personal thing and it's a corporate thing. But we should also gather with the saints to worship God together. We can do this through connect groups. And if you want to be a part of a connect group, please contact me. I'd love to make that happen for you. It's about being involved in these services online in our current season. And it's also about coming and gathering together as these restrictions ease. We should have a desire and a want to meet physically together as a people of God and praise, honour and glorify Him when we do so. And we're to continue in this. We're never to tire of doing so. To abide means to continue. It's about remaining or staying in Christ. It's about working on our relationship each and every day. We should never think we have obtained a position or a place where we no longer need to work on our relationship with him. It's a daily, moment-by-moment -moment commitment to him. And as Peter says... We should grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And if we want to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, we have to make constant decisions to follow him. We are told that we put to death our old selves. That's about putting aside our desires, our wants, our perspective on life and replacing them with what he wants being willing to seek his purposes for our lives are you willing to do that are you willing to say well lord it's no longer about me it's about you it is christ who lives in me 
And I want to live a life that honours and glorifies you. The easiest way to do this, the easiest way to begin to keep the words of Jesus in our hearts and minds is to read his word, to memorise it and ask him to bring these things to mind constantly. We need to allow them to renew us and revive us. It should change our mindsets. His word should be our guide and our compass. And we shouldn't resist him. We should submit fully to him. And when we do, when we submit fully to him, we allow him to shape us. And he will shape us. He will form us to be who he wants us to be. And I've told you many times, I never thought I'd be a pastor. My wife never thought she'd be a pastor's wife. And yet God has shaped us to be that way now. And we're so pleased to be in the midst of his will, exactly where he'd have us to be at this time. It's an incredible blessing to us. And so our lives, the way we live, is about trusting and remaining in his infinite, empowering, enduring and forgiving love. And if you've got no idea what I'm talking about, I'd love you to send me a message. I'd love you to contact the church. We'd love to tell you more about Jesus. We'd love to encourage you to find truth for yourself and to be found worshipping, honouring and glorifying him upon his return. So you will be with us in eternity. That's the ultimate goal of our faith. Let's just pause and pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your love that you pour out upon us so freely. I thank you, Lord, by power of Holy Spirit, you can help us to never stumble or fall. And Lord, I thank you that as we desire to draw closer to you, you draw closer to us and we can remain in you. And so, Lord, it is my desire that for each and every person that is hearing my voice, that they will seek out truth for themselves, that they will want to get to know you. And that, Lord, ultimately they'll commit their life and their way to you. Father, I pray for us that we will confirm our call by submitting fully to you. Lord, take us and use us for your glory. Use me for your glory, Lord. Allow us as a people of God here at SDBC become known for our great faith, for submitting fully to you, for seeing great works because you are moving amongst us by power of Holy Spirit. And Lord, will you begin that now? Move amongst those who are hearing my voice. Let them sense your presence. Let them know the things that they need to confess to you so they can draw closer. We pray this now, Father, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you, one and all. I hope you have a great week.
Let's just close this service with a word from Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God bless one and all. I hope you have a great week.